in an indie book seller. Living in New York's Hudson Valley. She has taught and or administered with prison education programs since 2006. She has authored three poetry collections, Kind, which she'll be reading from tonight, Visiting Days, and Doris's Red Spaces. She also co-authored The Lucky Ones, My Passionate Fight for Farm Animals with Jenny Brown. Her poetry publication credits include The Paris Review, Prairie Schooner, Plowshares, Field, Poet Lore, The Massachusetts Review, The Antioch Review, New Orleans Review, Rhino, Tampa Review, Best New Poets, and many other journals and anthologies. Kazim Ali says about Kind, if it is true that one knows oneself best by observing how one treats others, then this book of poems by Gretchen Primack is essential reading. Read these poems for the truth. they tell us about our relationship to and treatment of the creatures we take to be our property. Read this book and ponder its many questions. For example, who are the beasts and what can I do? Please help me welcome Gretchen Primer. All right. Hi everyone, it is thrilling to be here. I have loved the center since the first time I set foot there to hear Yusuf Komenyaka at least 20 years ago. It was a, a formative evening and uh, this is an honor. So yeah, I'm, I'm gonna be reading from Kind and the epigraphs of this book are from Miss Lucille, from Lucille Clifton. And they are as follows. Human is neither wiser nor more blessed. And the patience of the universe is not without. You too. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Did I hear somebody? Are we good? So um, you can tell from those that this is going to be a collection about that relationship between humans and non humans and questioning the assumptions that we make around that relationship. So I think an artist's job is to cock our heads and look at what is normalized in a society and look at what is taken for granted. Look at what we value, what we don't value and question it and muse on it and explore it and think about it. So that's what this book is trying to do vis-a-vis -vis animals and other, other living beings, other sentient beings like humans, for instance. And the patience of the universe is not without an end, right? So what are the implications of the way that we deal with other species? So that's what this book is surrounded by. I'll start with one that uh, takes its title from a line by the poet Jerry Stern, Gerald Stern. So he began a poem with this line. It became the title of this poem. When I got there, the dead opossum looked yeah, like. So, I don't know. Normally, like I sound really. When I got there, the dead opossum looked like a sleeping prince. He didn't want a majestic burial, as majestic burials are inane. He wanted his family back. He wanted to live, but we wouldn't let him. There were sweets to buy, and his route crossed ours, so we crossed him out. Nothing we could do then. And still, some middle-aged lady gathered him in her arms and keened his cold nose at her ear. So, you know, Tim did write the introduction for this wonderful book kind and while we're waiting for Gretchen to come back maybe Tim would like to say a few words um, about the poems that we just heard and will be hearing if I can ask him to unmute he can he can join us here <laughs> Tim Siebels was born in Philadelphia 
He has received fellowships from both the Provincetown Fine Arts Work Center and the National Endowment for the Arts. His collection, Fast Animal, was a finalist for the 2012 National Book Award and winner of the Theodore Rothgate Memorial Prize for Poetry. He spent a year as poet in residence at Bucknell University, and he recently completed a two-year stint as Poet Laureate of Virginia. A former faculty member of Old Dominion University's English Department and MFA in Creative Writing Program, Tim lives in Norfolk, Virginia, where he continues to teach for the Muse Community Writing Center. He has also led workshops for Cave Canem, the Writers Hotel, the Minnesota Northwoods Writers Conference, and Palm Beach Poetry Festival. Hopefully, he will come to teach a one-day class on Zoom at the Hudson Valley Writers Center soon. Voodoo Libretto, a collection of his new and selected poems, is his ninth collection, and it will be published in February 2022, right in time for AWP in Philadelphia. So thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Can you hear me now? Okay. Anyway, um, there's not a lot to add to what you said in the introduction and what um, Gretchen said to introduce the collection. Um, I can maybe I can just simply repeat that it's important that we simply rethink our relationship to the entirety of the living the living community. I mean, certainly the other creatures uh, that we share the planet with for sure, but also the entirety of it. I mean, when we think about what we have just survived, at least many of us have survived the, the pandemic, that at least to my sense of things might be related to how we've dealt with animals as a commodity. Um, since there's the thought that perhaps the virus originated in a different species that we were consuming. So it's just, it may be important to consider the implications of how we live as the, uh, sometimes I, I wanna say the smartest creature on earth, but that can be debated in a number of, a number of ways. Um, I should, maybe I should say, we are the creature with the most potential to transform the environment for our benefit and or to our demise. Um, and certainly we have already destroyed a number of other species. So I think what makes um, Gretchen's book important is that it is inviting us, if we dare, to reconsider how we are in relation to the other living things on earth um, and to re-examine our own arrogance as human beings um, who rightly or wrongly believe that we are the most important beings on earth. Um, again, that can be argued. Um, uh, I think there's a lot to be thought about. And in the book, in kind, I think what people will find is, is in various ways their own lives addressed. And it's not only in, in some hypercritical way or, or wagging of the finger, which would be, I don't know, I mean, maybe that can be effective in some moments, but that would be ultimately not that effective. But it's inviting us to, I don't know, widen, to widen the lens through which we imagine life on earth and our life in relation to other creatures. And that can never be a bad thing. Um, whether or not you'll ever be a vegan or whether you'll, you know, whatever, still worth thinking about how it is we are in relation to the larger world and the larger living community of which we are a relatively small part. Um, this is an aside and I'll stop. Is, is Gretchen back yet? I'll stop, of course. Is she back? That's enough. You don't need to hear another word from me. Go Gretchen. We need to hear many more words from you. Okay, yeah. I am so sorry, you all. Um, uh, we we lost power, so I'm at a neighbor's house and it's very spotty. Um, it's it's kind of yeah, it's a little nutty. I'm so sorry, and if it happens again, I'll just come back in 
by phone or you know tim can take over and do his thing um maybe it'll end up being a conversation where we end up trading some poems or you know i don't know um but i will jump right back in uh and ask um what it means just kind of going on what tim was saying what does it mean to really care about other species even ones that are not sexy and that are not considered valuable and are not even maybe considered animals. And so um, this book came out originally in 2012 and this is um, a reissue and it includes 10 new poems. And I was really happy about that. The new publisher wanted some new work and I wanted to do that. Um, you know, I hadn't written a poem about fish in, an, in a book about animals. And I think that's, kind of indicative of how we treat fish, but it was, it was definitely time. This is called Because You Are Silver. Because you are silver, because of your round eye and where it sits, because of your water home, your air distrust, because fins are frilled paper, not hands, because of your temperature. I can take your body, hook you up, in a flail, net you up with a thousand others, and no person will sigh for your life. The body, made for its home, just as any body is. It's flashing silver, it's cool fins and perfect eyes. Because our vaunted minds are too small to understand other minds, we will call you mindless and swallow you. Let me look that face in the eye and tell you, fish, I could no sooner eat your flesh than my own. There's a lot of art in this book. And um, I don't know if you can, this is the, there are three different painters who have work in the book. I like the interplay of different arts. I think we're all doing the same thing. We're just doing it a little differently. So the ways that we can work together, I really love that. Well, I cannot do a reading in the summer of 2021 without hitting on a certain pandemic. I don't know, some of you may have heard about this. Um, it was called COVID. And there were expected and unexpected side effects of COVID. And I think one of the unexpected ones was that when we went inside, animals were able to exist more freely. And so you would hear these stories um, of, you know, a, a bunch of foxes somewhere where foxes weren't purported to live or, you know, that kind of idea. And I ended up writing this poem around that COVID one. And yes, there's a COVID too in the book. This year, spring and summer decided to go on without us, to roll in the fields while we rolled in our poison. The glory, the relaxed breaths of it. Spring and summer pressed against each other, not a reed fit between. They made us wait while the birds built and snakes slummed. <laughs> and snakes sunned, and crocs snapped at their frogs. The air milded and cleared far from our sick beds because of our sick beds. Oh, human, see, you are important. Biology, hubris, apocalypse, ca cages, carbon, energy. You are important just not the way you think just not the way you wish well that may have been unexpected but what about the expected consequences of the way that we deal with other species well many of you are hopefully aware of the very inconvenient truth that the animal sector is responsible for a tremendous amount of climate change um, it's animal agriculture is responsible for more global warming than the entire transportation sector combined, for instance. So how we treat animals is why 
we're having to go through what we're going through. And it's important that we acknowledge that. Um, and here's a poem called Climate Change. A compass is always right. And I thought adults were like that, that they would figure it out. They would tremor in a shift and then true us. I grew into this world and its blood factories. Now I know only a compass is a compass. I don't like things hanging over me, so I'm anxious to get dying over with. But I want all this other trauma, this solvable hell, to get solved. And now. But there are no adults in that room. They are busy on the kill line. And which of these lines would slow that line for even a moment? Yeah, sometimes um, it can feel lonely and impotent to put words on a page, but even that has to be acknowledged, I suppose. And part of that lonely job of an artist is stepping outside of culture's box and examining even our most common assumptions from the outside. And now we'd love to pin you to the, both of you to the screen uh, together so we could have a Q and A. And let's see if we can just ask Gretchen to also unmute. Great. We good? We're good. And we do have a lot of questions from audience members tonight. So that's exciting. Um, you've been a great audience and we appreciate everyone being so patient with technological problems and coming here during this heat wave. The chat has just been flooded with compliments, so we'll also make sure to save the chat and send it to both of you so you can read all of the praise you're getting in the chat. Uh, the first question we have is from Claudia, and it's for both of you. How do you capture such a rich interior life and lands landscape in your poems, and then also fuse it with nature and the concrete, but ordinariness of day-to-day -day life? That question was, was a poem, so I'm just musing on it, you know? Tim, did you, did you want to address this beautiful poem? <laughs> No, that's you. You got it. Well, anyway, I mean, I'm not sure. I think the poem, that question might have been directed to you, but certainly I think um, I'll, I'll simply say this, that um, if one, if you're fortunate and you write a lot, sometimes several things converge without your fully being in command of them. Um, it is not unlike improvising, like a musician imp improvising. Um, there's a certain level of intuition and there's some some magic and there's some just certainly good luck, some just lucky synergy. Uh, and sometimes that the result is that sense of the interior being suddenly not abstract, but concrete and pointing directly to the daily. And therefore, what I hope anyway, when that happens in my own work, I'm hoping that it makes other people you know, feel more engaged in their own lives. I mean, I'm glad if they like the poem, but poetry is, for at least in my sense of things, is a way of fueling um, greater care um, in, in the larger community, to, to think more carefully, to think more broadly, um, and to think more imaginatively about our predicament as people. Yeah, I think it's it's like we're, if you've studied poetry or read poetry, and I know that this crowd, there's a lot of incredible poets in this crowd, um, there's a strong basis in, there's a strong history of poems that are very interior. And so we're, we're really trained around that and taught around that. And then those of us who think very externally wanna bring that in. So it, it makes it more of a balance between those between those elements and um 
again, a lot of the people who are who are here are are people who do want to do poems that are about provocation and witness. But it's kind of like about that marriage of the internal and external. And if you're a person who who thinks a lot about that external, it it can't help but come into what has often traditionally been, um, you know, amusing. Uh, amusing of the interior and an understanding of the exterior. You know, I read this article about Omar Sy, who, who's Lupin, you know, and um, he was talking about how, you know, you study and study and learn things so well, right? He's doing this with his acting that when he gets up there, it's all what Tim was saying. It's all just that he can be very loose and relaxed because all that training is in him. And so now he can bring that spontaneity and creativity and improvisation that comes of performance because he knows that he's worked so hard at that stuff. So I think that's also what's going on. Yeah, Thank Lupin. You so much. That, yeah, that was a great, that was a great answer um, from both of you. Um, we do have some very established, incredible poets in the audience tonight. And we also have our wonderful um, emerging poets who are our students at the Hudson Valley Writer Center here. And so I always like to ask on their behalf, um, advice that uh, the poets who come to read for us would give to um, poets putting together, particularly a first collection um, and any advice that you have in terms of ordering um, what to remember when you're when you're going through that initial process of revising a deep revision for the first collection after the manuscript is written. Um, all right, well, let me take that while I'm thinking about it and then force Tim to to take it when he's when he's further away from the question because I mean like that. And, um, you know, I like, my first collection was not really themed, but since then I've really enjoyed doing themed collections. And, um, and it's, it's a bit of a cop out when it comes to choosing what's in and what's out because you have this one theme, but it doesn't mean that you're not thinking about that ordering. Um, so the collection that I did before this one, which, uh, Jennifer reference, it's called Visiting Days. I've been um, teaching in maximum security men's prison for a very long time, but it's not just that, I also have a lot of friends and people I consider even family who um, I met in that environment. And I ended up with a collection that was themed around that, but how did I um, order it? Well, that I, I was thinking about that environment. That our environment is not orderly and um, you are forced to be cheek by jowl, literally and figuratively with other human beings. So the poems are trying to reflect that. They're, the order of them is thinking about the jaggedness and dissonance that can happen when you throw uh, a number of humans into one environment and paint them all with the same brush and act like they are the same, which is of course absurd. So, and then with this collection, very different. I was thinking about, you know, some of these poems are pretty heavy because um, our engagement with other species is very heavy and very intense. And, um, and I was really trying to think, I don't want this to be too weighty in a row. And I want there to be variety in the experience of the reader. Um, and, um, but at the same time, also be thinking about other, you know, all the different species and saying, well, you know, if we are humans who care about elephants, let's put the elephant poem and then let's put a poem about an animal that we don't traditionally care about, you know? So uh, I was thinking about all of those different things. So even when you're doing a theme collection, it doesn't mean that you're saying, okay, good, it's all the same. So, you know, let's not order. Okay, that's probably long enough. Anyway, um... I would say uh, for me, when my, my first book also wouldn't be easily considered by a single, I mean, known through a single theme. There may be, a, there may be a, have been a few currents of theme in the book. Um, 
So what interests me is a couple of things. One, to the extent that it's possible, you would like the collection to have a kind of narrative arc, not literally, but an implied narrative arc so that the reader has a sense that they are traveling poem to poem. They're not just reading one poem and then reading another poem, but that there is some kind of connection between poems, not, as I said, not literal, um, but just an implied connection. And sometimes it can simply mean that the poems are arguing with each other. Um, if not, and not exactly in terms of ideas, sometimes it's in terms of tone. Like you can have a, a funny poem, a really crazy funny poem, and then you can rub it up against a poem that's much more bitter and despairing. You can do that too. So to me, the idea is to marry um, the poems in such a way that they're speaking to each other, but that they also seem to move so that the reader has a sense that she or he is traveling uh, through the book, not that they're just kind of Oh, open it anywhere. It's all the same because people do that. And Gretch, you know, they do this. People just, oh, I'll read a poem here and a poem there. I don't know any poets who put a book together so you can just read it any old way. <laughs> I don't know any poets who do that. We all imagine the book traveling or moving a certain way. And that's why the chronology is so important. So I would just say, Keep that in mind. And the good readers will read it that way. And the readers who are less engaged, well, they'll may not read it that way, but still you want to read it. You want to write the, the, the book in such a way that your, your most serious and committed readers get the most out of it, you know? <laughs> that was really great advice from both of you. Thank you so much. I wanted to circle back to something that Gretchen said earlier, which is that one of the jobs of a lonely artist is examining our most common assumptions. I'm wondering if you both could speak more to that job, specifically as it pertains to all poetry and even more specifically your own poetry. Well, I'll start this time and then I'll say so many wise things that Gretchen won't have any insights left to offer. No. Yeah, I know how you I know how you how you are, Tim. <laughs> no, anyway, with regard to that, which is I mean, any of us who feel that poetry can both be lyrical and emotionally enlivening and informative and politically vibrant, we're always hoping you're always hoping that something happens in the poem that makes someone it can be it can be uncomfortable, perhaps, you know. <laughs> I mean, because I think in writing poems and in looking at the world that we inhabit uh, as poets and artists of of all kinds, there's real discomfort in trying to look honestly at how the world is um, in terms of gender, sexuality, race, class, war, peace. I mean, there are a million things that I would change were I the emperor of planet earth that I cannot change. And so in part, what I hope to do with, with poems that bear witness in various ways um, is to at least invite other people to think along those lines and to say, well, maybe we could, maybe the world should be different than it is. Maybe the idea that, you know, oh, it's just the way it is, or this is human nature, which every time someone says that, I just want to grab them and shake them. Anyway, um, <laughs> but that's the idea that, that a poem can be um, a, kind of, a kind of poke in the ribs, a kind of smack on the cheek, or kind of punch in, <laughs> punch in the chest too, you know, to make people say, okay, maybe I've been walking in my sleep. Maybe I haven't been attending to life as carefully as I might. That's one of the things I hope for uh, as I think about engaging an audience and seeing the world in terms that may often be missed. There's this incredible Angela Davis quote. She said, you have to act as if it were possible to radically transform the world. And you have to do it all the time. You have to act as if it were possible to radically transform the world. And you have to do it all the time. And for me, all the time means in the writing. 
And why do we need to radically transform the world? Because it's not okay. Because things have been normalized that should not be normalized. Because the fact that we have made the choices as a culture or as a species that we have made does not make them okay. They are choices. I'm telling this to my students all the time, even just in terms of their writing. Your writing is a series of choices. You are choosing all the time how to create a poem as an artist. And one of the choices that we make as an artist is how do we engage the world in our work? And for me, it's very, very important to, to write even things that make humans uncomfortable because they're in the name of trying to relieve discomfort for more humans, for more animals. My discomfort around somebody telling, telling me like it is about mass incarceration is way less important than the discomfort of somebody in a cell. My discomfort around somebody telling me what actually happened so that eggs can be on someone's plate or a milkshake can happen, that discomfort is way less than discomfort of a cow losing her child. You know, so I'm willing to go to those uncomfortable places to myself and even to others. It's not comfortable for me. I'd rather, you know, write poems about rainbows, you know, in a way that would be fun. But if I'm going to try to do what Angela Davis, my fellow vegan <laughs> sister, um, wants me to do to act as if it were possible to radically transform the world, that has to enter my, my work, even when it's lonely and even when it's hard. That's a great answer, Gretchen. And along those lines about um, things being normalized, uh, Lynn McGee has a wonderful question um, for you. She said, as Tim said in his comments earlier, your work brings up the question, what has been normalized? To write those poems, you must have had to free yourself from the normalized perspective it takes to be blind to the suffering of other creatures. You've spoken a little bit about how you did that. Um, what has been the benefit to you personally in doing that? And how can we you know, learn to do that as well, if you have advice for us? I, I feel very much at peace when I make choices in my life that reflect my heart and reflect, you know, and we all live with cognitive dissonance. We can't be perfect, nobody is. But the more I bring my value system into the way that I live and the choices that I make, um, the more at peace I feel. And so there's a way in which it's easier for me to take steps that are unusual and steps that denormalize then it would be for me to keep doing what seems normal and seems easier and what I'm used to and what's my habit and what's my culture and all that. We have so much that's pulling us in that direction in so many ways. And some people are always schooling me. I'm always learning about ways in which I'm, I'm not doing what my heart is telling me, you know, what, if I wasn't, if I wasn't ignorant around, around the issue. So, um, how did it happen? I need, I, I had mentors. I need, pe I had people in my face saying, really, this is what you think? Well, what about doing this? And what, it, you know, and there are writers who have done that. And there are friends who have done that. And there are speakers and, and artists who have done that. We're all in constant conversation. Um, and art has a role to play in that conversation. There are things that I normalize that five years from now, I won't because the right person will say to me or the right poem will say to me or the right document, what are you doing? Why aren't you looking at this? You know, I mean, I definitely had times in my life where I ate pastrami on rye and I had times in my life where I thought that prison was a good idea. You know, we're all works in progress, right? <laughs> yeah, if I, if I could add um, also, I think, um, part of the way this culture works is by keeping us, most of us, heavily distracted. And so a lot of times you don't even know what you're feeling. And so my mm. sense is that if you can make room in your life for silence, uh, if you can make room for honest reflection, sometimes real discomfort and 
the weirdness and the horror in some cases of what has been normalized will just leap up at you. And wow. as a, if you're lucky enough to be an artist, if you're lucky enough to have a skill, music, whatever, then maybe you can speak back to that. Um, there really mm -hmm. isn't, there's no magical way to engage, you know, the madness of any society. Uh, our society clearly has its any number of troubles that, de you know, so badly need to be addressed, you know? And so anything um, a poet, uh, in my case, can do to say, consider this, consider mm -hmm. how, maybe, how maybe your heart would be enlarged if this were the case, or if this idea were not prevalent. I mean, so you're always, you're, you're trying to engage people in such a way that, that they see that their own lives have been impacted by certain kinds of corruption in the culture. I mean, one tiny example, then I will stop. I don't wanna rant like a maniac, but if we think about something as simple as racism, for example, you can extend it to homophobia, uh, misogyny, you can extend this in any direction you want, but if you are carrying weird hatreds in your heart, you're not, you may in fact hurt me as a, as a black person, or you may hurt a woman, or you may, you know, say something horrible to someone who is gay, but it is your own self that is being damaged by this, this poison you're carrying in yourself. You know what I mean? It's like, it's not like you know, horrible attitudes only affect those at whom the, the attitude is directed. So you're, you're really trying to liberate, I think Brett, you said this, you're really trying to help people liberate themselves from certain kinds of terrible notions, you know? And yes, of course, I would love to live in a world where there were no racism, sexism, homophobia, classism, war, and all that. But, but you're also simply saying, you know, pointing, just pointing, saying, perhaps the world could be better if this were considered, you know, perhaps. I mean, because you can't really pound people over the head as much as we would like to, you know, um, because they, they'll just retreat. But you have to be able to say, consider this, look at this, feel with me on this. I'm stopping. Sorry. <laughs> that was an no incredible. apology necessary for that. Sorry, Sophia. No, that's perfectly okay. Thank you so much. Um, another question we have is for Tim. Um, and someone wants to know, what is your next collection working toward? Well, the very next collection is the new and selected poems. So it's kind of an overview of my, the last 40 years of my life as a poet. Um, so again, what I tried to do in, in various ways, and it's more difficult when you do it dealing with, you know, several books, but I tried to create in the new and selected collection, that narrative arc, that sense that one is traveling from book, from poem to poem, from book to book and so on, from era to era. Um, but beyond that, beyond that, and I'm a ways away from finishing uh, uh, another book, but beyond that, I, I'm trying to work out, um, uh, I'm working on a few different series. One is a series of MAGA hat poems. I don't know if they'll be in a book or not, but they're, you know, they're persona poems in which the MAGA hats of various perspectives speak. I've also been reading, writing those poems as, as I was speaking about earlier that in which the poem is a character in the poem. I have many, many, many of those poems now. I don't know if they will ever all be in a collection, but you know, I'm working on those things. The idea of just bending the perception of a poem in such a way that, I don't know, I'm hoping that it kind of electrifies the way we might imagine the livingness of, of poems. Um, and the last thing I've been working on lately are a series of People, what I imagine people would call Afro-futurist poems, um, which are these science fiction poems, basically, in which um, a, an extremely advanced species visits this, this earth um, and, and in various ways tries to discuss with us their own history in relation to who we are and also uh, give us a vision that as, because we are, I mean, let's face it, in many ways, we're a young species relative to many, many other creatures. We're pretty young. If we think about insects, just for a second, insects probably precede us by hundreds of millions of years in terms of being on earth. 
we are the kind of the new ignorant kids on the block. We have a lot of brain power and a lot of destructive power, but we're pretty young and pretty stupid in a lot of ways. Some lovely things that we do and some and also, but there's some really kind of idiotic things that we've kind of made part of a culture. And so this species comes and they in various ways begin to discuss with us to the extent that they can master our language, things we might not be able to see in ourselves. You know, so I've been doing that. So I'm very excited about it. It could be really insane. I have this kind of anxiety about it, but I really, I'm really uh, I'm excited about it for now. But those are the things I'm working on right now. Good Lord. <laughs> you need to spread some of that prolificness around. <laughs> Gretch, you know that without you, I would write not a single word. You know this. I know, I know. I. I know. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Well, I'm having, you know, I remember, I remember also that because I'm now retired, I have a lot of time to spend on writing and thinking about things. So that's given me a lot of, of juice that I can apply to language. And I hope to do other things, of course, with the time, but, you know, it's certainly given me some time to think and, and the pandemic to the extent that it kind of locked us in our houses. If I didn't write, I was probably gonna end up, as you know, hurling myself into the river. You know this. Right, right. So that's part of why maybe I've been working on so many things. That sounds like you do have a little time to teach a class at the Hudson Valley Writers. <laughs> yeah. I would do it, I shall do right. it, I shall do um, it. So maybe we could have you each read one more poem uh, since we had a little bit of a technical glitch in the beginning. Okay. So maybe Gretchen will read one more and Tim will read another one as well. Okay, sure. Great. I'd be honored. All right, um, Jennifer made a request and brace yourself. It's a heavy one, but, um, but I'm glad that you suggested it, Jennifer. Uh, this one is in a bunch of anthologies, including, is Camille here? Is Camille Dungey here? All right. Anyway, um, okay. The dogs and I walked our woods. And there was a dog, precisely the colors of autumn, asleep between two trunks by the trail. But it was a coyote. Paws pink with a clean through hole in the left and a deep hole in the back of the neck, dragged and placed in the low crotch of a tree. But it was two coyotes, the other's hole in the side of the neck, the other with a dried pool of blood below the nose, a dried pool below the anus, the other dragged and placed in the adjoining low crook, the other's body a precise mirror of the first. The eyes were closed, the fur smooth and precisely the colors of autumn, a little warm to my touch, though the bodies were not. The fur was cells telling themselves to spin, to keep her warm, to stand and hunt and keep. It was a red autumn leaf on the forest floor, but it was a blooded brown leaf and another because they dragged the bodies to create a monument to domination, to the enormous human. And if I bore a child who suffered to see this, or if I bore a child who gladdened to see this, or if I bore a child who kept walking, I could not bear it, so I will not bear one. All right. I know that poem, Gretch. I know that poem. Anyway, so I'll read um, one of the, the uh, Afrofuturist poems. And this is the first one. This is the very first one. It has an epigraph, space is the place. And that's from a, uh, some of you know who Sun Ra is, I imagine. There's a, a, 
a very strange and extended instrumental um, piece in which he repeats many times, space is the place. And uh, so that's the epigraph for this. And um, the title of the poem is Something Like We Did, Something Like We Did. You could tell they were surprised that we still tried to build cities. The way you and I might be amazed that birds can build nests without hands. <laughs> they saw how we lived and made a sound like rain sifting a river. For a lot of us, knowing we were not alone brought relief from the headache that had lasted all our lives. Of course, some people were scared. The religious held on to their books, claiming this was all make-believe. Even when it was undeniable, the 61 ships stacking light in the clouds, emerald green at dawn, lavender and late afternoon, the engines nearly quiet as if the sky were breathing. They walked something like we did, but the right foot moved twice for each step of the left. So it appeared they were either testing the ground or considering a dance. Their skin was dark, but transparent. Their hearts like ours, but visible. And when the military began to mobilize, all the big weapons turned into barrels of wine. And whatever we tried with knives or guns, we somehow ended up, ended up doing to ourselves until it seemed insane, even to us. Each time one of them spoke, it was like a piano if Cecil Taylor were playing, voices shredding the air the way chimney swifts swoop half turn, sling back. But after a while, when they watched us, their lips shimmered and something long ago closed their eyes as if we were a memory of who they once had been. And they'd come to earth to prove their existence to mark the promise of another world, someplace we might actually go if we could see inside ourselves and trace what was there. Wow, what a great reading tonight. Thank you all for being here. And thank you, Gretchen and Tim. And thank you, Gretchen, for putting this together and Tim for saying yes, that you would do it. Um, we've been looking forward to this for a long time and you guys have been such a wonderful audience. Don't forget to tune in for Arthur Z and Ellen Bass on Wednesday, July 14th. Wow. Um, we'll, we'll be excited to have you all sweet. back here on Zoom uh, yeah. for that. Um, check our website for all our upcoming readings. We have a lot of great people coming for you. So thank you all for being here. Sophia will send you um, the YouTube link when it's up and, um, and Sophia will save the chat. So we can send that to Gretchen and Tim. Um, so you can see all of the comments you've been getting tonight from your, your adoring fans. Uh, don't forget to buy kind. Don't forget to buy all of Tim's eight books. Um, and don't forget about his new book all of them. coming out in, in February, February 2022, in time for a Valentine's Day present. Um, so thank you all for being here. It was great to, to see all of you tonight. Thanks so much. It was fabulous. Thank you for having us. It was a real honor to read with Gretchen Primack. <laughs> Maybe we'll have Tim read a poem. I liked Gretchen's idea of alternating poems. 
That can sometimes be fun. Sure. I saw a great reading where Mervyn Taylor and Susanna Case did that. Yeah, I've done that um, a few different times with different poets, and it can be a lot of fun. It just depends on, you know, the meshing of the, the poets. Sure, I can read something. I hadn't thought to just read a poem. Let me think. Um, all right, because, well, I'll just read something. I'm it's trying to find a dull moment with Zoom. <laughs> okay, well, I was trying to find something that might be somewhere in the seg up with uh, what Gretchen, Gretchen was doing. I don't want to come from some completely different place. <laughs> Let me see. All right. Well, here's a poem. Um, here's a poem. We'll read it. I'll read this piece, and if Gretchen comes back in, great. Um, it's a, there was a series of poems I wrote um, in, a, in this book. This is uh, Buffalo Head Solos. And uh, there, were, there was a series called the Ambition Series and it dealt with different creatures um, speaking because animals, of course, generally, generally don't. And this is called Cow and Microphone. This is, and the cow is speaking. There's so much I can't make a sound for. Sunrise on a hillside or cool dusk bluing a meadow. Late June or better yet, mid-September when the first flecks of autumn begin to walk summer down from its tall heat. How can anything living not love the color light spins on October, when the bulls hum the last unnibbled pasture. Wonderful. Sometimes I think I could lend my own true music to that slow farewell, the daylight bleeding, a whole season turning away, switching its tail, and my voice an encyclopedia of lovely noise flies open to the first page and I'm Ella Fitzgerald's raging treble clef. I'm a four-legged flugelhorn, a glad clarinet, the radical ambassador scatting a voluptuous river of sax, blowing the rest of the lows into a dumb herd while I run the range of my whole Angus heart. Loneliness, the light, always a clear view to death, the bailing hands of the powerful and sweet, sweet grass, the earth's free bread grown back. And lately, the knowledge that an animal like me can't be heard exactly. And all this breaks out of my teeth into the bovine world. My bruised tongue, at last, an angel's lash, driving the stampede. And shouldn't I be the Pied Piper? My stomachs are full of rare news and the cruel promise of slaughter. Isn't the other language underneath this? Isn't there one word that still Brands you. Perhaps Gretchen is back. Yes, Gretchen is back. That was great, Tim. Thank you for jumping sure. in and reading that beautiful poem. And mm -hmm. Gretchen says she's on her phone now. Oh, and right. so that, um, <laughs> that should, yeah, the picture is even better. And I think she's unmuted. I think right. so. Yes, great. Welcome back, Gretchen. So everybody can see why I didn't want to follow Tim. And uh, no, but I like the back and forth. That's nice. So let's uh, let's keep that going if if uh, if you guys want. Um, so yeah, just a few more. And um, this one, if we can, uh, I like that he 
brought up cows and uh, let's stick with the cows for a minute. Let's think about them. Um, just the, the idea that, um, you know, we mammals only have milk um, for one reason and that's for our children and we only have it when we've just given birth, right? Well, that's true of cows, just like it's true of rats, humans, everybody. And of course, if we want that milk for ourselves, we need to do away with the child. Yeah. So this is a, a poem in the voice. I love persona poems. And this is a poem in the voice of um, a mother, a, a cow who's a mother. And it's called Holstein. I was also a child and also had one and another a year after and another, and could not touch even one. Had I been born into a kind world, my life would have been mine, not a stranger's, as long as my body wanted life. Had I lived in a kind world, child, this milk would have been yours. No one would have filled your lungs with loss. Put your head where your kind is born to be, but is never allowed at my flank. The great spill of me. Smell me from your bent neck, child. I am reading with um, Jennifer Franklin very much in my thoughts for obvious reasons and my admiration for her very much in my thoughts. And Jennifer and I share a love of pit bulls. So I thought I would read a poem that I wrote for um, one of our pit bulls who's no longer with us, Eleanor. And this is called Eleanor. I loved all of you, even the cancer in your neck and blood, even the sick mirror your black fleece, white cells, your bright red ones, the lymph and sera and your soft black mouth, all the elbowing cells keeping us up for each other a little longer. I humble before the system that built our illnesses, built your dog bones one by one and tied them together until you could walk toward me the system that filled them with pox round as zero, pox tough as hot. Let us walk toward each other until our faces touch. All right, so I'm very lucky because I get to live with a human who uh, feels the way I do has really a deep respect for species other than ours and who errs on the side of respect of them and changes his behavior to reflect that respect. And um, so I wrote him a love poem that's in here. It's called Husband. Um, and what should know, this is a poem about being a cannibal. Um, you know, when you love somebody so much, you just wanna chew them up, even if you're vegan. So that's what this is. And uh, his name is Gus, but Tim likes to call him Miles. So think of him as Miles tonight. And I'll end with this one and then just say what an honor is to read with my friend, Tim. We just figured out that we've known each other 15 years and our friendship is, um, really important to me, really special to me. So, husband. Now that's a leg even I would eat. And those Maury Sendak feet, those filthy wild thing toes in the woods and the workshop and the bottom of the bed, those are drumsticks I would fry up. What about that fool of a biceps? the color of a toasted bool. It could toast from the heat of my cheek alone. And when I slide my ear to your chest, I can hear that your heart is as sweet as a kitchen of cake. 
Those eyes are two crocks of bluestone, which none among us eats, but which snails press themselves into in the small hours of light and which you come bursting in to show me. And this is why I'd like to unfurl and swallow the plump noodle of your brain. Because its left side says, brachiopods, early Cambrian. And its right side says, let me go show my love. Thanks so much, you all. And thanks so much for bearing with my ridiculous technological challenges. Can you, can you, can you hear me? Yes, yep. we can hear you too. Um, uh, well, perhaps, um, Gretch, maybe during the Q&A, maybe you might read one more. It didn't seem like you got to really do your thing. So, I mean, if you want to read another one, you can, or we can do it during Q&A or something. I mean, you didn't read Yeah, that that's maybe. a good idea. Maybe in the Q&A um, okay. or, or in response to one of your poems then that she hears you read since there's such a great rapport between the two of you. And thank you for jumping in when she wasn't here. All right, well, however it works, I just would like to hear a poem or two more from Gretch. But that would be great. This is, I'll read um, another poem from that series um, that I read the other poem from the Ambition series. Uh, this one is called Primate Bipedal. And again, it's the primate speaking. I mean, we are all primates. I mean, I think that is often forgotten <laughs> that we are dead in that family, you know? <laughs> primate Bipedal. This, to find no distance between what I, what I am and what I seem to catch myself between myself and the mirror, unafraid, afraid of everything, everything. To not have history scaling my face, to break the thumbs that hung the world, to tear those hands with these dull teeth, human, almost, to hate, to reason, to burn, while the sphinx feathers my ear, saying, saying, who are you talking to? This, to be pure animal, my blood unlocked, my legs scribbled with hair, my soul perched on my shoulder, free unconvinced of my name, on my tongue for the first time, salt. To chase this, then be this, then sleep. This, I want this to be my life, to come back with a mouth ready to send new noise, to learn again how to stand how to put one foot down and the other a little farther along. This is a poem called The Gust. The Gust. In the mind, there comes a moment when shadows fall back like men from a gust of something, when the brain is light as a fly on your wrist. And in the jeweled eyes of that fly, you see your own six-legged self, white-shoed, dancing, swinging on parade the gold tuba grown from your lips. Zumpara cha-cha, zumpara cha-cha, zumpara.
I've written a series of poems um, in which the poem is a character in the poem. And I'll read, maybe I'll read more than one, but I'll certainly read this one. The, uh, the title is With No Hat, but the title goes directly into the, to the poem. With no hat, no shirt, no pants, the poem walks the early afternoon. Summer sun spots the odd shape on the road and offers a cloud for shade. The poem is headed downtown with its revelations, its beauty, all the intricate parts finally open to the general public who, though they try to deny it, have always wanted to see beneath the vintage clothes. The poem's previous modesty and stealth, its humility and restraint, its patient soft-spoken invitations have served no one really, not even the poem itself, which has always wanted the spotlight, the red carpet, sequin gown, the top hat, velvet lapels, ruby slippers, all its big front teeth inlaid with gold. The first people the poem passes look, look away, look again, their hope swelling like a fresh bump on the head. One guy tries 911, but the nine begins to shimmy like a new disciple. And the man's afro bursts into cotton candy. The poem loves it, loves being out, being seen. The almost cool walk flips to a Denzel stroll. I'm kicking new flavor in your ear, it says unquietly, meeting the eyes of drivers who swerve so sure they see what must be a mirage, a buck naked angel rump shaken beside the witless sprawl of their lives, their heads anointed with apocryphal music. The cars refuse the road, their horns reborn, scatting a fanfare of funkadelic clarinets. This is my body, the poem says, take and eat. I'll read another poem from the Ambition series just to keep tapping on that theme that Gretchen initiated with the idea of rethinking our relationship to living things. This is a poem called Mosquito in the Mist and the mosquito is speaking. You human types, you two-legged sapien sapiens, you guys are walking smoothies to me. Milkshakes wearing trousers, a cup of coffee mowing a lawn. I gotta hand it to you though. All the colors, the smells, tall, petite, skinny minis or whopping whale-sized Mother Humphreys, you got variety. I'm zipping around some summer nights and it's like an all you can eat situation. And I like the threads, hip hop baggies, halter tops, baseball caps, culottes, styling. And most of the fabric's flexible enough for me and my little straw. But I sense some chronic unfriendliness, some ongoing agitation from you hemoglobes. My family and me are small things, trying to quench a thirst. It's our nature. The random violence is really uncalled for. The bashing, the swatting, and the cursing. Fuck you guys, man. It's like you never heard of the word compromise. And the worst 
is when you pull down the curtain right in the middle of a good suck. I don't think I need to spotlight the obvious analogy, but okay. Imagine yourself alone with someone you want real bad. Her skin is toffee. His hair is an avalanche of dreadlocks. And the moment comes, the shared shimmer in the eyes, and you lean into the kiss, warm and rich as God's good cocoa. Your mouth's famished apparatus slurping up the sweetness. When, as if from hell's rabid handbag, a smack, big as Godzilla, knocks the living juji fruit out of you. The luscious touches, the hum of two hearts, the holy communion flung into the fat ass dark forever. What, you think I ain't got feelings? I got the memories, it's all in the genes. See, you big holes in the face, Mother Humphreys, don't never think nothing about other kinds of life. But that's all right. I got dreams, I got big plans. I'm all itchy and bumpy with discontent. And you might not see it, but I'm getting bigger. I've been lifting. And someday I'm gonna get a little payback on the go. Land on your cheek like a roundhouse kick. And before you can pick up your nostrils, I'm gonna drink you dry. Drain you to the leaves. You'll be laying there stiff as beef jerky, your arrogant balloon all flat and wrinkly while I lift off like a, like a goddamn 12-cylinder angel, like a bulldozer with a proboscis big as an elephant's dick. Thank you. I'll read a villanelle and maybe one or two other poems and then let's have a q and A. I I guess. Yeah. Uh, this is called, this is the all time, all the time blues villanelle. It's, it's pretty new. I'm especially, I just like um, so much that the blues grow, grew out of field hollers uh, that black slaves used when they were working in the fields. And the villanelle is a form that emerged from the Italian peasantry, I believe. Um, there's some debate about it because it happened a long time ago, but they used to do this kind of singing in the round to make the work go better. And it's the idea is the same with the field hollers, right? So anyway, so I've tried to, what I, in my own mad way, tried to merge them. And so this is the all the time blues villanelle. Hard to watch somebody lose their mind. Maybe everybody should just go get stoned. My father said it happens all the time. I knew a woman lost her soul to wine, but who doesn't live with their life on loan? Shame to watch somebody lose their mind. Don't you gotta wonder when people say they're fine? Given what we're given, I guess they act in grown. I think I used to say that all the time. When my parents died, I coined a little shrine and thought about all the stuff they used to own. Felt like I was gonna lose my mind. Used to have a friend who smiled all the time. Then he started saying he could hear the devil moan. Hate to see a brother lose his goddamn mind. Doesn't matter how you pull, the hours break the line. Mirror, mirror on the wall. How come nobody's home? Broke my soul for real when my mother lost her mind. Tried to keep my head right, but sanity's a climb. Been working on the straight face. I guess my cover's blown. My father tried to tell me all the time. Had one last question, baby, but maybe never mind. After a while, even springtime starts to drone. Hard to see somebody lose their mind. My pop said, boy, it happens all the time. Uh, 
Um, here's a here's a, another poem in which the poem is a character in the poem. And maybe I'll close with this one because our time is moving on. And uh, you know, I'll close with this and you know, we'll talk a little while. Uh, the title is The Sun Shone. And again, the title runs right into the body of the poem. The sun shone like most days in May and some senators stopped to watch the smoke thicken and twist in the unsteady wind. A few pointed, some half smiled as if they weren't sure exactly how to feel. Even though it was on air, the poem sat stone still in the street. Even with the acrid smell, even as the poem's face turned to ash and fell away. Most thought this was just one more trick, a well, a well played trope setting up the poem to make another impossible comeback. Raising its fist, traffic be damned, bearing its breast, saying what poems usually say about war, about sex and the soul and anguish, about the way this country packs its maw with black bodies. But the poem sitting in the lotus did not blink or move or seem to notice the unhappy cars, the well-fed White House lawn, or the curious tourists aiming their phones for a selfie haze in their hair, heat wrinkling the light behind them. The poem never said why it turned to fire for its final word. Maybe it was all the years getting up, getting dressed, tuning its throat, only to find itself disappeared in America. Jabba the Hutt, commander in chief, filling his cup with drool. And still the raucous cheers, still the red caps rallying like a virus. There's only so much a poem can do in solitary before it's just alone, humming to itself among things scrapped beneath the Xbox minds. Why not fire? Why not make meet the press ask why. Just one day of good suits and well-trained faces discussing who it was. Who did that poem think it was? But the poem doesn't think about itself. The poem doesn't think anything. This is me talking, me watching while the poem burns. Thank you. Wow, Tim, that was great. What a great reading. I love that Villanelle so much. Thanks. Thank you. So 